Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome back to The Amazing World of Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Today, we're honoring my mom on her 70th birthday with... Four old-time radio programs that aired on the day of her birth. Of course, in 2018, we have all kinds of quiz shows. In many ways, this can be traced back to the golden age of radio itself. As so many uh, programs, like You Bet Your Life, started out as old-time radio programs. And here's another one. The Quiz Kids. In the original iteration of the series, it ran from 1940 to 56 over radio and television. And uh, we're going to take a listen to the episode from August 15th, 1948. The Quiz Kid, brought to you by the makers of Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer for headache. Alka-Seltzer for acid indigestion. Alka-Seltzer for cold distress. Yes, when these occasional ailments make you miserable, take Alka-Seltzer for really fast Really effective relief. Well, there's the bell calling class to order, quiz kids. And listen, here's today's first question. If Dewey is elected, what is it that he will wear into the White House that no other president has had for how many years? Yes, there's our first brain teaser this afternoon. You listeners have a few seconds to think it over while the youngsters here in our classroom get ready for roll call. And here they are, the quiz kids and the chief quizzer himself, Joe Kelly. Thank you, Bob Murphy, and hello, everyone. Well, here we go with another competitive question session in radio's famous classroom of the air. And competing in this 425th Quiz Kids broadcast, we have Mike. I'm Michael Mullen. I'm 10 years old, and we'll be in the sixth grade at the University of Chicago Laboratory School. Rennie. I'm Rennie Templeton. I'm 13 years old and going into ninth grade at U High. Joel. I'm Joel Copperman. I'm 12 years old in 8th grade in the Volt School. And two new quiz kids, Harriet. I'm Harriet Claire Fry of Park Ridge, Illinois, and I'll be in the 8th grade at Lincoln Junior High School. And Ira. I'm Ira Lee. I'm in U U High, and I'll be in the 8th grade. And now back to that first question from John Albert of Quincy, Massachusetts. If Dewey is elected, what is it that he will wear into the White House that no other president has had for how many years? We have three hands up. Rennie's hand was first. Rennie? Well, that'll be his mustache. And there's been only the mustache, I think it was William Howard Taft was the last one. And And, uh, uh, how long ago has that been? Is that 36 years? No. No. You're very close, though. 32. No, I'm afraid you're guessing now, (laughs) Joel. Well, uh, of course, the inauguration was in 1913, so it'd be uh, 35 years. 35 years is absolutely right. That's fine, kids. I I really didn't think you'd get that number one question, but you certainly did. Now, uh, this next question is from Charlotte Andrews of St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, tell me, what king was recently replaced by a saint? What king was recently replaced by a saint? That's question number two. What king was recently... uh, Joel? Well, I don't know it, but I... uh... I imagine it would be a member of the St. Paul Saints, but I don't know where uh, the king gets in. Well, now, wait a minute. We have another hand just about to go up. Uh, Harriet, what were you going to say, honey? I don't think that's right. I was thinking of King David, but I'm, I don't think it would be right. Oh, you give up on that? Well, uh, the king would be Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King of Canada, and uh, the St... Uh, look at Joel's hand. All right, Joel. St. Laurent. The what? St. Laurent. That's right. Mr. Louis St. Laurent became his successor as head of the National Liberal Party, and he will also become prime minister this fall. Well, that's a miss, and that means that we uh, have to give um, Charlotte Andrews of St. Louis, Missouri, 
credit for stumping you on that one, kids. And a big Zenith radio phonograph combination, too. Now, this beautiful set has the new Cobra Tone Arm, automatic record changer, and two FM bands. And it's always Alka-Seltzer's reward when the quiz kids miss your question. When they answer correctly, you also receive a radio, a Zenith Transoceanic Standard Shortwave portable set in a handy luggage case. Either Zenith is a radio you'll be proud to own. So send your questions along, friends. Send them to Quiz Kids Chicago. Well, now, children, you are to pretend we are at a baseball game for this question from Alex Trunko of Logan, West Virginia. The sports announcer is none other than our own Robert Leo Murphy. <laughs> and you Quiz Kids are to be the official scorekeepers and call the plays. Now, it just so happens that in this game, one unusual situation follows another. See if you know how to score each play. Here we go. Here's the pitch. And it's a fly to the outfield. The center fielder is going back. Well, what do you know? The ball hits the fielder on the head and goes into the stand. All right, now how would you score that, Joe? Well, I think it would be a ground rule double. No, no, sorry. Rennie. I was just going to say ground rule level two. No, sorry. Mike. Wouldn't that be scored as a home run? A home run, that's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> that's what it would be. Now let's see if we can get this next one. Uh-oh. Looks like a wild pitch. The batter swings and misses. Hey, the ball hits the plate and bounces past the catcher. All right, kids. How would you score that? Mike. That'd be scored as a dead ball? No. Joe? Oh, it'd just be scored as a wild pitch, but no. as a strike. No, now, wait a minute. Ira? Oh, I was going to say strike two. Oh, uh, Rennie? Well, wouldn't it be a wild pitch and a pass ball? And you'd send your runner down? Well, the batter would be safe at first, since the catcher missed the ball. Of course, it counts as an error for the catcher. All right, here we go with the last one. Two men on base. Here's the pitch. It's a pop foul. The ball is caught. Hey, but wait a minute. It's caught by the third base coach. The coach absentmindedly caught the ball. And that one, Joel? I think it'll be counted as all out because I think either last year or a couple years ago, that uh, same incident happened in Cleveland. The Cleveland uh, coach caught a foul ball, and it was counted as out. That's right. It really happened in 1945 when the White Sox played Cleveland. The coach was Bert Schott. The batter's out. A member of his own team interfered and prevented the third baseman from catching the ball. Well, I'll tell you now, um, we, uh, we were a little weak on that second part. And in all fairness to the party who sent this question in, we're going to see that they get one of the big Zenith radio phonograph combinations from the makers of Alka-Seltzer for sending that question in that you quiz kids couldn't quite answer on the second part. And that's Alex Trunko of Logan, West Virginia. Now let's clear up our What's It question of last week from Mrs. Archie Rue of Lamoni, Iowa. Uh, the last clue we gave you was uh, it first came to light in 776 B.C. Mike? Well, we think it's the uh, to light that started the Olympics. That's the right answer. That's very, very good, Mike. The Olympic torch. That's just what it was. Because the Olympic torch is part of the ancient uh, ceremony of the Olympics. Now, let's clear up the clues. The uh, first clue was Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, and John only half brought it on. Remember? Well, John, Mark is the name of the runner who brought the torch into the arena as part of the opening ceremony preceding the Olympic Games. And second clue, Hastings and also White Sand Bay helped escort it along the way. You remember that clue, of course. Hastings and White Sand Bay were ships that brought the lighted torch part of the way. And then, of course, the uh, third clue, it first came to light in 776 B.C. The first games were held in 776 B.C. All right, now then, kid. Get set for this week's mystery question from Oscar Speaker of Battle Creek, Michigan. It's a where's it question, and this is your first clue. Now listen. Look, pal. That's quick and to the point, isn't it? Now you can all go into a huddle, and I'll call for your answer right after Bob Murphy questions our listeners. Yes, Joe, and I know I'll get all hands up on this one. Here it is, folks. As you're sitting there relaxing, enjoying the leisure of this fine Sunday afternoon... 
Don't you hate to think of getting up early tomorrow morning and going back to work? And say it'll be twice as hard if you wake up with an, an annoying headache. You know, that sometimes happens, and I hope you also know what to do about it. If you've ever tried Alka-Seltzer, you do, that's for sure. Yes, thousands say there's nothing quite like Alka-Seltzer for really fast relief from a headache. The reason is this. Alka-Seltzer is already dissolved when you drink it. That means its pain-relieving ingredient, sodium acetyl salicylate, is ready to go to work instantly. And because it's in sparkling solution, in other words, because of that fizz, Alka-Seltzer gets there fast, gives fast relief. So it will pay you to remember, when headache causes grief, misery can be brief. Take Alka-Seltzer for relief. Ask for Alka-Seltzer at any drugstore. All right, now, children, uh, you can get out of your huddle and uh, let's see who has the answer to the question, the mystery question. Joel? Well, we're not quite sure, but we'll say Virginia. You'll say Virginia? No, I'm sorry, that's wrong. But I'll tell you, we'll have more clues a little bit later on. In the meantime, let's get along with more questions. Glenna Faust of Lansdowne, Pennsylvania, wonders how much help you would be to your parents if they were having trouble with garden pests. Now, first, what vegetable or plant would be in danger if you found a bug with a pale yellow back covered with 16 dark spots? Mike. Your beans. Beans. Because that beetle is the Mexican bean beetle. That's right, the Mexican bean beetle. Well, say, what do you know about that? Now, here's one to look out for. A worm with small brown spots on his sides unless he's a big papa worm, which will have stripes down each side in addition to dots. Mike? Wouldn't that be the, uh, the uh, European borer? Uh, the the, uh, what corn, kind of a... the uh, European corn borer. The European corn borer. So it would be corn, yes. <laughs> and next you find a more fierce-looking worm that has a horn on its tail and arrow-shaped markings on its side. Mike? Wouldn't that be the tomato hornworm? It certainly would, so it would be the tomatoes. <laughs> you certainly know you're worms, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> now, this question is from Cecil O. Harper of San Diego, California. Can you children reword this sentence so as to retain its original meaning, but without using any of the R's? Now, listen. Robert gave Richard a rap in the ribs for roasting the rabbit so rare. Harriet? Well, um, you could say Dick gave Bob a slap. Well, we start out with Bob, so we just reverse oh, the two names. Bob, Bob gave Dick a right. slap on the side yeah. for cooking the bunny not enough. That's the girl! That's it, all right! <laughs> That was just dandy, Harriet. Yes, sir. That was all right. Now, let's see what you kids can do with this opera question. From Gladys Joe Richter of Seattle, Washington, our organist Howard Peterson will play parts of two opera arias. You kids are to tell who is singing what in which opera. Now, listen to the first one. <laughs> Je suis Titania, uh, and it means I am Titania yeah. from, um, um, I can spell it, but I, I never can pronounce it. It's M-I-G-O-N, um, something like that, Migon or Mina. Mignon. 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 Ah. Uh, by Ambrose Thomas. And uh, who sings it, by the way, honey? Titania. Uh, well, no, what's her name? Uh, the, that's uh, the name in the song, but what is her name? She sings, I'm fair Titania. Um, She's the queen of the fairies. Well, what is her name, though? Let's see, Joel. I don't quite remember her name. It was that a actress, uh, it was the actress in the play that uh, Wilhelm nearly fell in love with. I think her name was Frederica or something. No, like that. no. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you give up uh, her name, and I, I must, we must clear that up because that's what I ask you. I say you were to tell who is singing what in which opera. Her name uh, is uh, Felina. Well, Lena sings, I'm fair to Tanya. Well, that's, uh, that's a miss, but we, we'll see what we can do with the rest of this question. Uh, <clears throat> now, let's, uh, let's listen to uh, the next one. Uh, 
All right. Uh, do any of you recognize that? Who sings what? This time. All right, Joe. No, oh, but I'll, uh, it's, but, no, I don't even know the opera, but it, it, I think it uh, would be one of, uh, Wagner, Wagner's operas, because it does sound like one of Wagner's words. No, no. Uh, let's, uh, Howard, could you play a little more of it, uh... <laughs> Well, no hands up as yet. Uh, the opera is uh, I Pagliacci, so that should give you a clue. Joel? Well, I don't know, uh, but uh, no, I'd well, rather... Uh, well, the uh, uh, character in that opera that was most of the... It sounds like a sad piece, and the character in that opera that was sad most of the time was Canio, so I'd say it would be Canio. No. Sorry, sorry. Ira? Uh, is that Tonio? Tonio, that's right. Tonio the Clown. Uh-huh. That's right. Now, what's the, let's clear up the name of the selection. That was what? What was the name of it? All right, you give up. The name of it is uh, C. Puo. That means may I. That's from the prologue. Well, I'll tell you what let's do. This uh, last part of this question is really a humdinger. I'll tell you, we have to practically put on an operatic scene here in the classroom, and the, the opera is Carmen. Act two has begun. We see the interior of an inn. Gypsy smugglers from the mountains joined by some officers and soldiers have been dining. Some are talking, some smoking. A few begin to dance. Suddenly, Carmen, who has been watching the dancers, rises and begins to sing. And that's where you quiz kids come in. Who wants to be Carmen at this point? All right, uh, Harriet. Uh, and what does uh, Carmen sing? She sings a gy gypsy song. That's right, honey. Well, uh, can you sing part of it for us? Well, um... Tra-la-la-la, 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 tra-la-la-la-la-la, tra-la-la-la, 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 you saying that just as well as Carmen does. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, now it's time, uh, it's about time for the inn to close. The group is breaking up when shouts are heard off stage announcing the Toreador. Long live the Toreador. Escamillo enters and joining in a toast, he sings what? Ira? The Toreador song. All right. So... Votre toast, je peux vous le rendre, Seigneur, Seigneur, car avec les soldats, où il est torero, peut vous s'entendre, pour plaisir, pour plaisir, ils ont les combats. <laughs> well, that was really wonderful, children. Uh, uh... I'm sure that everybody loves opera will agree with me on that. I, uh, I'm sorry to have to tell you that we missed the first part <laughs> on this question. That means that Gladys Joe Richter of Seattle, Washington, will uh, receive one of the big Zenith radio phonograph combinations from the makers of Alka-Seltzer. Why, that was real fine. We all enjoyed that a lot. Now, here's a dandy question from Captain M. Uh, William Westfall of uh, Fairfield, California. If motion pictures had sponsors similar to radio programs, which movies might each of these companies sponsor, judging by the names of the movies? Now, the first uh, company would be the Bell Telephone Company. What uh, movie, uh, Rennie? Well, there are a couple. It could be Miracle of the Bells, <coughs> or no. A Bell for Adana, or yes. Who the Bell Tolls. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Fine, Joel. Well, there's a new movie, Wrong Number. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. 
course, if the telephone company's listening, you were just fooling around here a little bit, yeah. All right, now, how about the Hamilton Watch Company? The Hamilton Watch Company. Uh, Harriet? The Big Clock. The Big Clock, that's one, huh? That's a movie. Uh, Rainy? Watch on the Rhine. Watch on the Rhine, that's another one. Can we think of any others? Joel, you can't give us a funny one now, can you? <laughs> Rennie? Well, there you are. Uh, Hamilton watches are supposed to last, so it could be this time for keeps. This time? Oh, I get it. I certainly get it, yes, sir. All right, those are all fine. Now we're going to see how long you quiz kids can keep this going. It's from Mrs. Clarence B. Foster of Grinnell, Iowa. I'm going to go down the line and give each of you a chance to name an animal or bird associated in one way or another with one of the 48 states. Then I'll go down the line again, and we'll see how long you kids can keep going on this. All right, we'll start right off with uh, Mike. Now, you all understand this, don't you? Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, Mike. The Pelican State, Louisiana. Louisiana, Pelican. Harriet? Um, he gave mine. <laughs> oh, he gave yours. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, I'll catch you on the way uh, back. Uh, Ira? Uh, the Poppy State, California. Poppy State, California. Um, Joel? Well, I expect. You pass. All right, Rennie? Well, we got to get back to Louisiana. Louisiana kingfish. Uh... Well, all right. I don't <laughs> imagine Louisiana would uh, mind uh, getting plugged two times here. All right, uh, Mike? Michigan Wolverine State. That's right, Michigan Wolverine State. And uh, Harriet? Kansas Sunflower. What, dear? Kansas. Uh, well, we're talking about animals or birds, see? Oh, or birds. Well, but you're, you're all right on that uh, score, uh, but we must have an animal or a bird associated with the... Various uh, states. Ira? Well, there's a lot of fish in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, all right, now I'm going to accept so that. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. And Joel? Uh, oh, uh, I passed before. Do I go again? <laughs> the, Badger, the Badger State, Wisconsin. The Badger State, Wisconsin. Rennie? Uh, which is it? It's uh, the Gopher. The Gopher State, is that? Uh, yeah, what state uh, is that? Uh, the Gopher. <laughs> now, some, some of them right here in the studio. Uh -huh. Gopher State. All right, what, what state is it? Quick. I'm stuck on that. All right, Mike. Okay. It's Minnesota. Minnesota. I got another one. I got another one. All right, Mike. Delaware, the Blue Hen State. Delaware, the Blue Hen State. Very, very good. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, we, I guess we could uh, keep on going here. Ira has one, I think. Uh, Illinois, the Quiz Kid State. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, Joel. Uh, Kansas, the Jayhawk State. The Jayhawk State? Kansas? Jay Hawker. Huh? Jay Hawker, isn't it? Well, I, uh, no, I, I, I think Joel is uh, correct on that. Uh, I'm not sure. All right, uh, Rennie. Rhode Island Reds. Rhode Island Reds. <laughs> well, I guess we could go on all afternoon, so I'll tell you for this next one, uh, we uh, return to our where's it question. Now, remember the first clue was, uh, look, pal. All right, and here's your next clue. Garland, Dunn. And Joan Fontaine, Grant, Astaire, and Marjorie Maine. Now, I'll call for your answer in 60 seconds. In the meantime, uh, Bob Murphy is going to question our listeners here. You bet I'd like to, Joe. And ladies, I'm wondering what you do when you run up against one of those days when everything seems to go wrong. Why, I can tell you, Mr. Murphy. As all women know, there are dozens of little irritating situations that arise in every household every day. Now, we women can't work miracles. But we can and do rely on the help Alka-Seltzer can give us in many cases. Now, let's see. You mean that... Oh, you know very well what I mean, Mr. Murphy. Take the other evening, for example, when John came home after work. He was cross and irritable with a headache. And what did I do? Why, I just let Alka-Seltzer help straighten that situation out. And, of course, it did. And in a hurry, too. Right? Oh, it certainly did. And, you know, Mr. Murphy, that's what we like about Alka-Seltzer... It's so dependable, always so fast-acting, not only for relief from headache pain, but for acid indigestion, too. Yes, when someone in the family overeats, out comes the Alka-Seltzer bottle. And when someone in the family has that ache-all-over discomfort of a cold, or, or when muscles get sore and tense, well, Alka-Seltzer is ever so good in helping to relieve such distress. Then, because Alka-Seltzer is such a help in so many ways... You'd say it's a good idea always to have that extra package handy? Oh, I know it is, Mr. Murphy. I always ask for two packages instead of one. And I can give you the reason in rhyme, too. An extra package on the side keeps the household well supplied. 
All right, children, are you all ready with your answer to the where's it question? Who's going to be the spokesman? Joel? Well, uh, we don't quite know again, but we'll say to Zigfield Folly. <laughs> no, you're way off. <laughs> well, here's one more clue. This 200 inches brought the spot renown. Try looking up, stop looking down. Joel? Mount Palomar? That's right, Mount Palomar in California. Now, we're, I'm, I'm going to clear up the clues. Uh, look, Pal, of course, was the first clue. Refers to the telescope on Mount Palomar. And the names of movie stars uh, suggest uh, stars which are seen through the telescope. And uh, 200 inches refers to the diameter of the lens in the telescope. And, of course, try looking up refers to the mountain and also to the telescope on the top of Mount Palomar. Say, now, wait till you hear the first clue for next week's mystery question, Quiz Kids. It's a doozeroo. It's a who's it question, and here is the first clue. Now listen. Three feet, nine and a half inches, and one millimeter. Now there you are. Now you can mull over that for quite some time. Billy Johnson, New York City, has a tongue twister math problem for you. If a brace costs six bits and two bits are four bits each, how much would a brace of brace and bits cost? Boy, that's a mouthful. Joel? Can you please repeat the question? <laughs> I will if I can, my boy. Yes, sir. If a brace costs six bits and two bits are four bits each, how much would a brace of brace and bits cost? Joel? Have I got you on this? Uh, it's, uh, six bits would be 75 cents. That's right. And uh, could you repeat the rest? <laughs> Well, now, wait a minute. Ira had his hand little... up uh, shortly after you got your hand up. Ira, what were you going to say, son? A dollar and sixty-four and a half cents. No, I'm sorry. No, that's incorrect. If a brace costs six bits and two bits are four bits each, how much would a brace of brace and bits cost? Rennie? Well, that would be, let's see, a dollar twenty-five and two fifty. Two dollars and fifty cents. Absolutely right. Good girl, Rennie. Now this, uh-oh, uh-oh, well, there's the bell, and of course that means that we'll question the judges on this next one, kids. Yes, who won? That's what we want to know, and we'll have the answer in just a moment. While we're waiting, let's listen to this important message about one-a-day brand vitamins. Friends, don't take chances. Are you sure you're getting all the essential vitamins you need from the food you eat? Remember this, government surveys show that the meals of three out of four persons are short on vitamins. Don't take chances. Instead, take one-a-day brand multiple vitamins. Lack of vitamins in your food can cause you to feel under par and run down. So take one-a-day brand multiple vitamins. Sixty capsules, two months' supply, only two dollars at any drugstore. Potency guaranteed by Miles Laboratories. Lack of vitamins in your food can cause you... keep you from feeling your best and looking your best. You can't afford to take chances. Take one-a-day brand multiple vitamin capsules. Well, the judges have finished adding up the scores, children, and they've just handed me your report cards. Now, remember, we're using our new mathematical formula for scoring, a system which takes your age into account in giving credit for correct answers. And don't forget this, either. Whether you win or lose this afternoon, you will each receive a $100 security bond from the makers of Alka-Seltzer to help you with your future education. Now, then, let's see. According to the judges... Our entire class missed three questions this afternoon. Rennie was first, Mike second, and Joel third. And inasmuch as Rennie and Mike are leaving with their parents on vacation, the next highest scorers will return next week. That will be Harriet and uh, Ira, and, uh, so, and also Joel, of course. And they will compete with Patrick Conlon, age 11, and little Melvin Miles, age five years. Now, let me remind you, quiz kids, you have some homework to do. Oh, sure. You'll want to give some thought to our mystery who's it question. Now, remember the clue. It's three feet, nine and a half inches, and one millimeter. And say, I wonder how many of you folks listening will be able to think up the answer. Well, be sure to attend school next week and see if you're right. We'll be calling roll at the same time next Sunday. And until then, this is Joe Kelly dismissing the quiz kids. Goodbye, kid. Bye, Mr. Kelly.
listen to the Quiz Kids every week and listen to Alka-Seltzer's News of the World every Monday through Friday on most of these NBC stations. This is Bob Murphy speaking. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Welcome back. An interesting show, a little bit more low-key than uh, uh, today's programs, but some good production values. I did think the answer to the question about Governor Dewey was a little bit pedantic, because it had been 35 years since America had a mustache president. However, if Governor Dewey had been sworn in, it would be nearly 36 years from 1913 to 1949. Now, of course, they did change the date of the presidential inauguration uh, from March the 4th to January the 20th. Still, I would think that 35 or 36, either one should be all right. By the way, it's interesting to note that the streak of not having a mustache president actually continues until this day. It's been 105 years since Taft left office, and yep, no uh, new presidents with a mustache. And very few major candidates. I think the last major candidate with a mustache for the Democrats was Jesse Jackson back in 1988, and then for the Republicans was Alan Keyes in 2000, but neither of them made it past the primary. The last uh, guy with a mustache to end up as a major third-party candidate on a national ticket was Pat Choate in 1996, who uh, was Ross Perot's uh, second running mate. Admiral Stockdale, who didn't have a mustache, uh, was the uh, running mate in 92. And Choate had not only the mustache, but the full beard. So a bit of a throwback in that way. Actually, the way the facial hair worked for the presidency was interesting. Prior to Lincoln, none of the presidents were traditionally uh, portrayed as having facial hair. You know, they might have had, you know, like a beard for a day or something uh, where they weren't shaving for whatever reason. But prior to Lincoln, no one was known for wearing a beard. From the time Lincoln started wearing the beard until Taft left office between 1864 and 1908, candidates with facial hair won all but two of the presidential elections, the 1896 and 1900 win by William McKinley. And even in 1900, McKinley had the mustached wearing Teddy Roosevelt as his running mate. I mean, that period in American history was the bearded age. But I digress. Actually, quite a bit. But at any rate, we present old-time radio and presidential facial hair trivia. It's all part of the service. Speaking of presidents, join us back here for our final episode as we take a listen to an episode of Mr. President. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.